This chamber was uh, established in 1921, and I believe the role has always been the same, which was to support and advocate for commerce and uh, business. The chamber during the recession uh, experienced a, a decline in membership. Members weren't finding value anymore. I think it wasn't just the recession that a lot of chambers were experiencing. I think this chamber uh, lost its way in terms of how to deliver value for its members. The board that really had become complacent, that really wasn't moving things forward for the business community and, and, and maybe in some cases had self-interest and etc. We were losing members right and left in terms of no value. Uh, the chamber, when I was on the board, we were trying to find solutions of uh, different sponsorship opportunities. We were trying to create ways to bring in revenue, but we weren't really looking at why there was no value in what uh, members were, were, were getting. And this was true for chambers across the country that were finding themselves not to be relevant anymore in today's world. With my background in marketing, uh, and the fact that I w had been in this community for 10 years and understood some of the relationships and, and the, um, the dynamics, the core values of this community, I felt that with my background, both um, leading operationally a large facility and a lot of businesses within that, I knew how we needed to bring value to the members. We had to really throw the baby out with the bathwater, as I like to say. I like to say we had to stop resuscitating this baby and really um, throw out almost, almost everything we had done to um, look at how we could be relevant today in terms of social media, in terms of uh, people being time deprived. Uh, how do we allow members to get value without showing up to a mixer or to a networking event? Um, not all members benefit from that, but also not all members can get out and, um, and participate because they can't leave their cash register, they're running a little business. We had to look at how do we, uh, how do we give value to members and how can we um, try to uh, niche market in a, in, in, a, in a certain way which chambers typically don't do because they say you can't be all things to all people. But we said, well, we have to be something to somebody. And so therefore, we started to look at uh, the website and social media and how do we start to drive traffic for businesses by creating that. We started to reach out to different, different sectors of the community, different types and sizes of businesses. Um, we started to um, evaluate what was needed, what was missing, you know, and then we would reach out to leaders in those communities, in those areas, in those business genres, and we would um, reach out to them to join the board. And how we would start with that is the board is allowed four chair appointments, and so we would appoint them for a year, and we'd say, Check out the board, see if you like it, see if you want to continue, and then you could run for election the following year. And many of them got elected. And that's how we evolved the board. The board then, um, right now, is a, is a great um, representation of our business community. Once the board was evolved, then things just took off because the board then became engaged. And now I had a whole team that helped um, to provide that vision, to move us forward in a direction, and critical people that were experts within their field of, of, of helping to direct that. The other thing now in terms of change, what I did is we didn't just say, oh, we have to provide value and here's value to everybody. We raised membership 20%. No one had raised membership. They were too afraid. Well, people will drop. They'll drop if we don't raise. We had to stop apologizing. Once we did get something of value, we said, we provide good value and you should pay for that. We actually adjusted to a tiered to due structure. Instead of saying to members, well, um, you have uh, zero to five employees, so you pay this much. You have 25 employees, you pay this much. Your utility company, you pay this much. We, um, we started to package benefits and deliver, and we said, okay, we're gonna sell you a package of deliverables just like a gym does, just like any membership uh, type of business does. We said, we're, you get to pick 
rather than me providing you the same benefits and I have to pay the same amount as someone else, I have to pay 10 times more than someone else who's getting the exact same benefits as I am, now you're getting more benefits because you're now deciding what package, what level you want to be at. And at first that was very frightening because we thought, well, then everybody's just going to go to the lowest level. No one's going to want to be at these higher levels that we already have in some cases. And um, surprisingly, people found value. We created a shop local program called Eat Shop Play West Hollywood, and it could be defined into three different brands so that we could do three different types of promotions. If it was Halloween, we could say Play WeHo, uh, so that brand would be its, its own brand as well. If it were um, the uh, design district shopping, holiday shopping event, it's Shop WeHo. If it's uh, uh, a taste of West Hollywood, it's Eat WeHo. So we could have three brands as part of this and then also collectively promote them promote those brands as well. So now you have these savvy marketers on my board who create this wild ad campaign with esoteric copy and really racy, you know, racy, racy kind of eat me, buy me, play me, bed me, you know, and yeah, wed me. Exactly. We added wed me when the Supreme Court decision came down. And, and, and so we put that out there in newspaper ads and billboards and and uh, uh, the city channel, and so we've been promoting this, um, and this website has gotten a lot of traction. Most uh, meeting planners are so used to being in a convention hall or a hotel where everything is right there, but people want another experience, and so we want to give them an experience of the destination or an experience of the venue. So um, if it's at Pacific Design Center, as an example, it has two buildings with a long walkway in between, we could have a conference in the Silver Screen Theater and another meeting in the Blue Conference Room, but we could create an exhibition of photography through the hallway as they walk from A to B. We can do the same within the destination of an experience between the Comedy Store and the Andaz Hotel when they have a meeting there or they go to an event over at uh, the Soho House. So, so the idea was that we may not have big convention hall, convention center. We don't have the infrastructure to build a convention center, but we do have fabulous venues, great hospitality, great meeting space if you get creative. And how do we communicate that? How do we promote that to the meeting and event planner? When I looked at our, you know, our pie chart of how much revenue was coming from membership, most um, chambers, I think, are a lot less. I think they're like 60 or 65. And we had a huge amount that just came from membership. And I think we do focus. The heavy lifting is on the small business. And so our focus and our time and effort is spent on that. Now, we spend a lot of effort on the other 20%, but that's mostly at hearings and city council or planning commission. That's for projects. And, and a lot of those aren't even... Again, they're not even relative, depends on the year. It could be years before part of that 20% it needs my help. So to me, the focus has to be on the 80%. I do think there was a shift. I think that it, did, it was the 20% that had the focus before. I, I, and I do think that was part of the demise, yeah, because I think that part of, I mean, I, I think I, I can give examples, and I know that I have other colleagues who will agree with this, that the focus was so much about the board and the leadership and the higher paying um, uh, business members that, it, that the chamber did get a rubber stamp mentality or that we were only out looking out after the larger developers or the larger businesses or that, it, or that our events were all about the bo being on the board and not about the membership. So we did take a concerted effort. Our board looked at how do we make this a membership organization and how do we give the, the newsletters were all pictures of board members and, and staff. And we said the newsletter should be all pictures of members. You know, they all look for themselves. You're like, yeah, you want, yeah, and they all look for themselves. And, they, you know, they, and, and just like our board members did as well. I mean, we're not shutting out. Our board members are members as well. But it, the uh, board installation, it was the annual meeting and board installation. It was the annual meeting part got lost. It was all about the board installation. So we, the board uh, last year, uh, two 
two years ago changed this and put the word member in the, the annual member meeting and board installation. When my staff were calling people to buy tickets, they said, oh, I thought it was only the board thing. Um, and that's why we changed it. We doubled our, our, our net profit. Um, in fact, all of our, we kept three signature events. We changed them so that all the events were the same. They were all the same audience, the same sponsors you'd reach your hand out to, the same. So we really changed things. We made the, our upcoming event, Creative City Awards, all about the membership. The board used to vote for the winners. They'd say, here's the winners because they can buy a table. Um, and we instead gave it to the membership. And we said, who do you think should? And people voted for themselves, of course. Um, but it's their, it's their chamber. Um, and it became a membership event. It became exciting. It became the members voting for their peers. And it became them trying to lobby for votes. And it became, you know, it was exciting. What I understand, I spoke to someone who does economic development in another city, and she says sales missions really aren't that effective anymore. And so I was looking at a crowdfunding type of idea. So I think crowdfunding, especially with the explosion of it, especially with people working on legislation right now for it, that this is an opportunity to incorporate it into a strategic um, economic development plan as, as a part of that. The old way of doing economic development is dead. Let's work with our neighboring cities. We just did a conference called State of the West Side, which was all of the West Side uh, city managers from the different uh, prospective cities, Culver City, Beverly Hills, uh, Santa Monica, and then we had economic development from LA downtown. And talk about, do we work together? How do we work together? How do we start to share information so that we all benefit from that? In 2010, the first half year that I was here, um, we connected with a member who uh, did a six-week series called We Host Social. And it was all bringing in people from Yelp and Groupon and uh, different social media, uh, the Sunset Strip, Nick Adler, who started Adler uh, Integrated, which was all about social media and how he took the Sunset Strip, which when he saw Tower Records close, now Nick Adler is Lou Adler's son, who opened the Roxy and created Rocky Horror Picture Show. And he said the defining moment for him was driving down Sunset Boulevard and seeing Tower Records closing. And he said, we have to stop the velvet rope mentality. He said, we have to start socially engaging the clubs to work with each other, to not be competitors of the destination, but to start to tell people at the Roxy to go down to the comedy store and tell the comedy store to go to the Viper Room and the Viper Room to go to the Whiskey and the Rainbow. And they started things called um, the Social Strip, which created, I think, 66,000 followers within the first month that they did it. They um, started something called a tweet crawl where they did, um, you know, different, uh, they'd have everyone situated at a certain time, then they'd tweet to the next location they were going, and it started to engage uh, those clubs and, the, and that community. And then they started a farmer's market to engage the local community to come down and start shopping at, at a night market. So again, social media is key to this. We had to just completely turn ourselves on our heads to, to, to see it completely differently, to get rid of the scavenger hunts and the passport events and the things that um, chambers think are so effective. Now, do we still do a ribbon cutting? Yes, people want that. We actually have a member who's been a member for 20 years. She does every year an anniversary ribbon cutting. That's, her, that's what she loves. She loves that about the chamber. How do we create a, a, a synergistic relationship between the residential community and the business community so that we support each other? We're all championing the same types of development for the community, that we're all speaking with the same understanding of what our core values are for the community. And that goes hand in hand. All of these are connected, Michael. They're all connected to how do we then cultivate political officials who will um, speak with that voice, who will create policy with that voice, who will be visionary enough to make change so that it starts to develop things like housing needed. So some of the things have to change uh, from a government level on policy and how to streamline for businesses. And how do we start to identify in each of the areas of our city what's needed for business? 
I think a chamber needs to be politically influential, um, but that stems from starting with the community first and finding out what their needs are and uh, what type of community they want to see built. To be a chamber of influence um, that brings community and business together with one voice. Thank you.